Manos, thank you very much. Uh, so let's see. Okay, is that going or not? All right, go back one here. All right, so let's uh, look at the scope of the problem here. Uh, this is from TCT 2014. A nice summary about ISR as a the problem that we face worldwide, actually. More than 200 million people, as you know, live with PAD globally. Less than 2% get treated. Uh, more than 400,000 FEMPOP stents implanted every year. About 250,000 ISR cases, you know, that we see worldwide. Uh, in the U.S. alone, we have about 115,000 cases. If you look at the stent volumes, growing by about 6 to 7 percent annually, 30 to 40 percent first-time ISR incidents within two years of implant. And if you retreat those patients, you know, you have about a 65 percent uh, recurrence rate within the two years. So very sobering data, you know, that we have. So how do we classify uh, FEMPOP? ISR, you know, this is a commonly used as a classification, the Tosaka classification, essentially uh, dividing that into three classes, less or equal 50 millimeter in length, uh, more than 50 millimeter in length, and totally occluded. And if you look at, uh, you know, the meaning of that classification, it has to do with, you know, the follow-up after you retreat those lesions with uh, plain old balloon angioplasty, and you can see, you know, the patency with the CTO, you know, right at uh, three years is probably about 20 percent or so, and if you look at the one-year mark, you know, the patency is almost in the 20 to 25 percent, very dismal, very uh, poor data overall. But if you look at class one and class two, and even, even with the um, uh, first year, uh, you can see that there's a little bit of an advantage of a shorter lesion, but then at one year, you know, these lesions start to almost behave similarly in terms of uh, loss of patency. Uh, again, uh, you know, I think the, the biggest uh, advantage of that classification is distinguishing, uh, in my mind, between the CTO versus the non-CTO in this case. And if you look at the mechanism of ISR, you know, of course, uh, vascular injury, uh, you know, first you got the platelet adherence, the activation. This is a, a very early response uh, led uh, immediately by smooth muscle cell proliferation, usually happening within weeks. And then you get the extracellular matrix production that happened within a month. Uh, recoil negative remodeling, not a big uh, uh, problem here in ISR, except, of course, if you have put a stent in a very calcified uh, vessel, uh, you probably have quite a bit of recoil there that would contribute to the uh, restenosis. Of course, there's a lot of clinical and angiographic risk factors, diabetes, renal insufficiency, we've seen that. Poor runoff could be a problem. Uh, some biomarkers like C-reactive protein. Uh, again, we've seen something like the CTOs, we've already talked about that, uh, task D lesions and the long lesions. Uh, so again, there are some other possible mechanisms you have to keep in mind. You know, stent fracture can be a problem, stent design, strut thickness, stent overlap, uh, barrier trauma of adjunctive angioplasty post-stent, how, how, how the pressure that you put in could make a big difference. Uh, poor stent expansion in calcified vessels, uh, thrombosis, as you know, all ISR lesions, uh, particularly the one occluded, are almost always thrombotic, restenotic in nature. Uh, then there is a, uh, the slow flow in the distal vascular bed and small vessel size. Again, if you uh, uh, look at some of the strategies to treat FEMPOP ISR, the first four, pretty much falling off favor, plain old balloon angioplasty, cutting balloon cryoplasty, and radiation therapy. I'm not going to spend much time talking about those. You know, and, and now we're seeing, uh, you know, atherectomy, restenting, drug-coated balloon, or combination therapy uh, probably is where we're heading. Uh, so for atherectomy, the laser, as you know, it's on label. The jet stream currently being utilized is an off-label, and the Silver Hawk has a contraindication, even though it's quite effective. The restenting, you know, is uh, either with a bare metal stent, covered stent, or drug uh, uh, coated, uh, you know, uh, or drug eluding stents. And then you get the drug coated balloons, including the specialized balloons. So let's look at the laser atherectomy. You know, you're looking at uh, photoablation as a mechanism of action using photochemical, thermal, and mechanical uh, ways to, to eliminate the, the scar tissue. Uh, and as you can see the, from the very early data, you know, using just the laser elite, you know, you can see that uh, there was a higher success rate in treating those, about 92.5%, but a lot of embolic debris that occurred, uh, you know, with the, with the use of the laser. Uh, distal embolization requiring treatment was only 2.5%, but almost 50% of those patients had some form of a filter uh, placed. And in fact, if you can see that, uh, usually at about the six-month mark, that's where things start to 
go downhill very quickly. And you can see that curve going very quickly down and kind of almost stabilized by, by almost a year. So it's very important when you look at FEMPOP ISR not to limit just your observation to the six month because you can see between six month and one year there's a rapid decline in patency and rapid, uh, rapid increase in target lesion revascularization. So now, uh, you know, you look uh, next going from the elite, which is we know it's mostly a pilot kind of channel, going into the uh, booster, you know, cutting more tissue out. Does that really make a difference? This was uh, started with the patent uh, registry in, in Germany. Uh, 90 patients, you know, was, was a non-randomized prospective registry. Shorter lesion length, 12.3 uh, centimeter, uh, and uh, there was about one in three cases total occlusion. Again, distal embolization was seen, about 10 percent. Procedural success, however, was very high. And you can see at six months, the patency was 64 percent, then goes all the way down to 37 percent at 12 months. And if you look at the TL the TLR was at one year 35.6 percent. Looks a little bit better, you know, than just using the elite. Maybe debulking is a better thing, but also these are shorter lesion we have to keep in mind. Then, of course, we have the pivotal trial, the EXCITE ISR study uh, that led to the approval of the laser for ISR treatment. This was a randomized trial, 2 to 1 randomization for laser versus uh, POBA, uh, 250 patients, and you can see that the TLR rate was 26.5 uh, percent at six months with the laser versus 48 percent, you know, with balloon angioplasty establishing at least at the six month mark the superiority, but that also at the one year mark, that pattern seems to continue. But again, look at the curve and you can see the decline, the rapid decline, you know, in the uh, survival of uh, TLR survival uh, that you see between six months and one year. Uh, so again, if you put those three together, you know, the elite, you know, uh, versus the excite, same lesion length, but the amount of debulking is substantially more, you know, with the excite, you can see that your uh, uh, percent TLR seems to look better. But if you look at excite versus uh, the patent, they have um, uh, pretty much the same technique, booster and tendon probably do the exact same debulking, but you can see that the lesion length also makes a difference. So again, more debulking and, uh, and uh, shorter lesion seem to have uh, better results in that situation. Uh, so this is a uh, more uh, poor sign data that came from the use of the jet stream. This was some of the preclinical data that was done uh, prior to the uh, uh, launching of the jet stream ISR feasibility study. And as you can see, the um, uh, this is a, a poor sign model. The first, uh, um, I'm not sure if I can. Point, yes, he, this is your uh, uh, MLD at baseline. Uh, then you look at the uh, two passes with the blade down and then four passes with the blade up. And this is uh, your um, uh, IVIS images. Uh, and if you look at the uh, IVIS images, you see a beautiful cylindrical cut of that tissue, you know, that seems to increase from going from the blade down to the blade up, a consistent increase in the uh, tissue debulking and seems to be very predictable, at least in the animal model. Here in this model, uh, you know, uh, the different scenarios have been tested, including partially overlapping stents, fully overlapped stents, stents across branches, and so forth, and established really that uh, at the, the bottom line is beyond a two blades up cut, you're not going to get much tissue excision. So really, that's your optimal number of cut is two blades up. And when you look at high resolution radiographs, you know, you can see the stent integrity was maintained. And I'm not showing you here some of the scanning electron microscopy and some of the uh, histopathology that was done on this, also showing stent integrity to remain um, uh, pretty much preserved in that case. So this is the Jetstream ISR six-month data. This, was, uh, this is currently in print. Uh, this was a 29 consecutive patients, 32 limbs. Uh, lesion length is 19.5 centimeter, very comparable to uh, what has been done in the Excite. Procedural success was 100%. Device success, you know, less than 50% with the device only was 75.8%. There was 9.4% distal embolization, no stent fracture by core lab analysis. Six-month TLR was remarkably low at 13.8%, and the patency rate was about 70%. So if you put the uh, Jetstream uh, treatment in comparison to the uh, Excite, you can see the same lesion length. Uh, again, uh, TLR going from 21.9 to 13.8%. Uh, whether that reflects more debulking or not, we're not sure, but the reliability of the gesturing for debulking is very clear. Uh, again, uh, you can see that, uh, you know, with the patent, you know, which is a shorter lesion length, uh, you know, almost similar results, you know, when you have a long lesion length uh, as you are using the gesturing versus uh, the booster. 
And if you look at uh, some of the tips, you know, when you use the, uh, when to avoid the jet stream, you know, I would avoid the jet stream uh, blades up or blade down in case of uh, significant display, stent fracture, stent edges, you know, when the stent is malaposed, uh, I will avoid the blade up in case of the class three fracture or any type of stent under expansion that you see angiographically. Uh, I would definitely avoid a lot of bends and tortuosity. You wanna avoid that blades hitting on the stent pretty hard, you know, when, when you have biased lesions or biased wires. Uh, again, I would uh, say the most important thing is if the stent is unopposed, that's probably where you really want to avoid that. Now, this is the problem overall with atherectomy, a lot of debris that occurs. I don't think there's any atherectomy device that is spared this problem. Uh, you see it in the laser, you see it in jet stream, you see it in Silverhawk. Bottom line is this is something that uh, you have to watch for. We use filters a lot when we treat uh, ISR uh, in almost, I would say, in about 50 to 60% of our cases. So what about uh, you know, some of the cases? This is a, a baseline uh, you know, CTO uh, and post jet stream only, you know, remarkable uh, cleaning of that CTO, and then you can see post balloon angioplasty. This is another case you know, where you see the, uh, uh, the baseline, the narrowing in the mid uh, SFA, uh, post jet stream, and then post angioplasty, great results. Uh, so again, consistent results, that's another case you know, post jet stream, post angioplasty, we find that technique is, is very uh, good in our, at least in our lab, and I use it quite a bit. Uh, bottom line, I just wanna re remind you, this is an off-label technique, uh, just for the sake of disclosure. Uh, so we uh, let you, based on that data, we're, we're launching the JET ISR. The JET ISR is, a, uh, is essentially uh, trying to validate the data of the JetStream ISR uh, in a multi-center format. You know, this will be done in conjunction, you know, with uh, Dr. Banerjee's team here, as well as our uh, team is gonna be 14, uh, you know, sites in the U.S. Uh, is gonna be uh, a prospective, non-randomized. There will be some historic comparison to uh, uh, PTA data. There will be Core Lab, IVIS, and QVA. We're looking at TLR six month, but also one year data will be all collected for patency as well as TLR. And we're looking, of course, at safety, which is the unplanned amputation, total mortality, and target lesion revascularization at 30 days. So direct coded technology, I'm not gonna go over that in details. Prior speaker have already covered a lot of this. The Zilver PTX data is, uh, uh, seems to be very uh, promising in that regard, you know, but the problem with the, with the um, uh, in the ISR world, you can see the freedom from TLR was only 60% at two years. So again, remember, this is an ISR problem. You already have stents in place. Now you got 40% of your patient who are gonna have another set of TLR. So how, you know, you get another layer of stents in them, and now the layers of stents start to accumulate. This is really a problem for those patients because we do not really know what the long-term outcome of that uh, of that numerous uh, layers of stents in these patients. And you look at drug uh, eluding balloon and treating FEMPOP ISR, you know, this is uh, data from, from uh, Stabili and, uh, published in 2012, uh, 39 consecutive patients using the impact balloon, short lesion, 8.3 centimeter, again, high technical success, procedural success was high, uh, but you look at the TLR rate, remarkably low at six months and one year uh, with the about 8.6% at one year, patency at 12 months was 92.1%. Just wanna make sure you, you realize, however, these are short lesions, 8.3 centimeter. Again, you look at the debate ISR data and 44 C, uh, uh, diabetic patients, 64% were CLI. Uh, again, this is an intermediate lesion length, 13.2 centimeter. Uh, however, relatively good data with patency at 12 months, 90.5%, TLR at 12 months, 13.6%. The FAIR trial was, uh, was an excellent trial, was just published in circulation. It was a randomized trial of 119 patients treated with DCB versus post for the FEMPOP ISR. Again, the lesion length, unfortunately, still very short, 8.2 centimeter. You know, at six months, however, recurrent restenosis with the drug eluding balloon was 15.4%, and in the angioplasty arm was 44.7%. Already, we are seeing that drug-coated balloon will establish probably a more standard, standard of treatment, at least in these short lesions, you know, as we have seen in FAIR and multiple observational data. Again, the freedom from target lesion revascularization was 96.4% versus 81% at six months and 90.8% uh, versus 52.6% at 12 months. So very favorable data for the short lesion using the drug-coated balloon. 
DEB after directional atherectomy. This is uh, data that was published uh, with 89 lesions who all received uh, atherectomy, followed by either uh, POBA or DEB. This is more retrospective. Uh, and, and the lesion length, however, 17.1 centimeter, pretty, pretty decent uh, long lesions. And as you can see, the patency at one year was very much in favor of the drug eluting balloon compared to the POBA, uh, you know, with a significant hazard ratio of 0 0.28. So again, multiple trials are on the way for DCB and FEMPOP ISR, you know, and hopefully we'll hear more about this, you know, with more power and, and uh, more strong data. Uh, for the covered stent, I can only mention to you the RELIANT trial, which is a, a very important study that uh, looked at covered stent versus standard balloon angioplasty, and as you can see, the 12-month primary patency rate was remarkable at 74.8% for the Viabon and 28% for the uh, angioplasty group. Uh, technical success, of course, will be pretty high with the Viabon uh, and with less uh, success with the PTA. Now, this is kind of putting it all together. Uh, if you can see, the atherectomies are all on the left side, uh, you know, uh, and, and the drug uh, eluding balloons on the right and the covered stent right in the middle. And you can see the atherectomies being applied a lot into the long lesions. Uh, and as you can see, there is a, a clear uh, decline with more debulking at the six month mark when it comes to TLR. Uh, on the other hand, however, there is a catch up phenomena where the TLR rate goes really high at one year. Seems like a predictable response no matter what the atherectomy device you use. You know, at one year, you know, you're going to lose quite a bit uh, of your uh, patency. On the other hand, when you look at the drug uh, eluding balloon, most of the data seems to be in the short and intermediate lesion. They look highly favorable, but whether we can extrapolate that data to the long, more complex lesion is still unclear at this time. And we're still, of course, waiting for those major registries like the global, uh, you know, registries, you know, uh, either SAFE or the, or the registries with the impact balloon. Again, I think the bottom line is uh, long lesions, total occlusions, and re thrombotic lesions. That's where atherectomy is likely to be most beneficial. The uh, benefits is mostly in improving the acute procedural success, reducing the need for revascularization on the short term. Uh, definitely better than POBA uh, you know, on the long term, but still the overall results are poor. Uh, watch for embolization, watch for expenses. Uh, Drug-coated balloons have excellent results, but the data mostly apply to short and intermediate lesions. Drug-coated stents also have good results, but apply to intermediate lesions. Uh, atherectomy, again, improved these acute procedural results, and I believe it's the marriage of atherectomy and drug-coated balloon that's going to enhance our acute results and improve our long-term uh, uh, data. So you're probably going to end up needing both technology, uh, and this combination is yet to be tested uh, in a, a very good, powerful study. So we're, we're hoping to see these uh, studies on their way. And that's it. Thank you very much.